All right, well, it's 918. We're about three minutes in. Um, welcome, everyone, to um, another installment of our regular L1 AMA series. Um, for those just joining us for the first time, um, we do these pretty regularly to update the community about our latest feature releases, fill you in uh, about what we're developing and designing together at Lamina One, and of course, answer questions about what we're up to and how it fits into our vision for the open metaverse at large. So the topic of today's AMA, um, as you probably could tell by the event invite, is all about the Creator Studio, which is a new tool set for L1 creators that'll enable you to easily publish and customize content to the Lamina One beta net. You don't need to code, no smart contract skills required. We tried to make it super easy to just upload, publish, and start using content on the platform. Um, last week, uh, late last week, when we released the tool set, we also published an introduction post and a whole bunch of quests around the launch that'll kind of walk you through the update, tell you a little bit more about it. So I'm going to link that in the chat now. Um, uh, if you want to pull that up while we're kind of uh, answering questions about it. Um, and also just for a heads up for people who really want to dive deep, we also do have a brand new section in the L1 Users and Developers Guide around this new tool set, detailing more of kind of like the inner workings of the new tool set, how it integrates into our existing spaces and NFT items framework, and kind of like more of the brass tacks on, you know, how it works, how content um, can how the structure can sort of like enable interoperable content across our platform, um, the kind of like sharing of items across spaces. So again, check the chat out. Really intense reading materials that we pulled together. But yeah, we're super excited about this tool set. And I think you guys are too. Um, I think though, like that said, what better way to get to know a new tool set than talking directly to the people who made it itself? which is um, why today I'm joined uh, by our Chief Technology Officer, Will Carter, um, who's here to kind of like walk you through um, the Creator Studio and answer the over 600 questions that you guys all submitted about it um, to us over the past week. Um, I will say before we dive into questions um, as well, I just wanted to give everyone a kind of a quick update on how testing has been going so far. So. Last I checked about 10 minutes ago, over 2,100 items have been minted on the Lamino One Hub since we launched this new tool set on Thursday. Um, according to you guys, we've had about a 93% success rate for publishing an item using our two demo templates. And about 75% of testers who did not have any difficulty or notice any bugs. That said, for the 25% uh, of users who did notice bugs, we actually ended up logging about like 37 different issues or comments or errors. Um, as just kind of a quick update, I know like a ton of you have been kind of like in the weeds with us, sharing screenshots, sharing thoughts. Um, 13 of the bugs have already been solved. Um, they're going to be pushed live to the Lamino One Hub over um, the next couple of days. We've got 14 that are in progress or testing. We're continuing to watch. Um, if you post a bug and we're asking you a bunch of follow-up information about it, that's why. Um, some of these can be kind of funny and tricky to diagnose. Um, and I will say 10 have either been flagged as shrug emoji, low priority, and or will be looped in with future, future releases on the Lamino One Hub. So um, I think just in general, you know, if you're having any issues or have any questions um, outside of this kind of initial week of testing, feel free to ping us in the BetaNet feedback, feedback channel. Um, we also do have a designated feedback form um, that we can link you to anytime where you can like kind of upload screenshots and do all of that stuff. Um, anyway, though, before I bore you all half to death with community management disclaimers, um, let's kind of dive into some questions and learn more about the Creator Studio and uh, the latest launch. <laughs> uh, Killen, yeah, that's shrug emoji. That exact shrug emoji was what I was referring to. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, we'll get ready for a bunch of questions. We've got quite a few. Um, I guess to kind of kick off, we got a good question that I think is a good starter from Alexa Dov 1990 who just asks, I just want to hear more from you about the new hub features. What's new this month for L1 builders and creators to dive into? Great way to kick it off. Um, so as you're all 
uh, aware, we just launched the new Creator Studio, which was the big thing we've been working on for a number of months now. Um, we think it's a pretty big moment for the community. Um, the highlight of the studio is um, kind of its ability to provide a range of customizable templates to you, the community, um, which enable you to easily design and produce a wider range of digital content. Um, right now, obviously, it's it's fairly limited. You can either create um, digital artwork or um, customize lasers for space lasers, but eventually this is going to expand to um, a much wider um, array of digital content. So we're looking at avatars, we're looking at items in general, um, generic items that would be interoperable across multiple spaces, um, different types of um, entertainment and media. So looking at music, videos, uh, literature. Um, so really this will be a way for you um, to utilize no code user flows to quickly uh, create, parameterize, customize, and then publish content across a whole array of, of um, content verticals. Um, all while adhering to um, these interoperable specifications that we're building, um, which, you know, which alongside that, um, we're also releasing an API um, that could be leveraged by games, experiences, external applications um, that can then tie into the interoperable specifications that are embedded in these templates. Um, and what that offers you as a um, application creator is the ability to create an app um, and then immediately access an ecosystem of compatible content that can be um, easily imported into that app. So if you're in our last AMA last week, um, we started diving into the complexities of interoperability. Um, and we think this is like our first step towards achieving some form of interoperability. Um, so that's kind of what you're going to start seeing uh, evolve over the next few months. This will be released in phases where we'll uh, be releasing new templates. Eventually, we'll offer you the ability to make your own templates. Um, and then uh, we'll be integrating in some potential external partners and tools as well, uh, which we'll talk about later in the AMA. Awesome. And uh, welcome uh, to our Chief Product Officer, Gordon Maddy, to the stage. He's uh, going to answer some questions as well. And I will say, I just checked our Slack while Will was talking, and it appears that our uh, developer, Baltazar, just pushed a new batch of fixes to the Lamino One Hub. So those 13 bugs that I talked about that we um, have effectively squashed should be live. So again, thanks to everyone who's been reporting stuff. Um, really happy to be building this together. Um, as a quick follow up, and I think Gordon, I'll give this one to you as a kind of an intro to the stage. So Ray X Aranthos asks, you know, what is the main purpose of the Creator Studio on the Lamina One platform? Like, why did we build it? And how does it contribute to the sort of development and expansion of the, the sort of open metaverse that we're envisioning? Hi there. Sorry, I'm late. I had the time wrong in my head. So I'm glad I didn't miss all the questions. Um, I, yeah, I think that, um, you know, it really starts with creation. Um, you know, the, the metaverse, which largely exists today in different forms. Um, you know, you can even consider something like Spotify as a metaverse experience or Instagram as a metaverse experience. It's just, they're just not fully interoperable. Um, you know, content doesn't easily flow from Spotify into other platforms um, or vice versa, actually. You know, each of these platforms has a pretty principled view on what content is within their ecosystem. And within an open metaverse, we imagine content is much more portable and compatible in lots of different places and places where you can experience it. And so what we are really focused on from a creative studio perspective is giving creators complete agency over their creations um, so that they have full control at the point of publication. Um, and then uh, kind of continuing to embody all of the information about an item, its royalties, its rights, um, um, all of the metadata, the semantic metadata helps you understand what the item is, the technical metadata that understands, you know, um, um, how you might actually want to um, handle the particular asset. For example, if it's an image, like knowing its resolution is really useful, as well as the behavioral metadata um, in terms of how things um, might kind of um, present themselves in different spaces. And when the creator uh, kind of um, 
has complete ownership of that, then they have some control over um, how those uh, how that content is going to be rendered when it gets distributed. That could be distributed into a specific space, like a game, for example, um, or it could be distributed into other kind of end user products. Uh, so, for example, take um, take, take a, mu a musician that's uh, creating a track or an album, and they want to kind of like create something and have complete control over that particular asset, and then distribute that into many different places. That could be um, delivering that item into Audius. It could be going into Stoner streams or kind of Web three music experiences, or it could even potentially you know flow into something like a Spotify. Um, but giving the, the the creator control over the asset itself and how it's going to be rendered and how it's going to be consumed and interacted with in those in those different different spaces. Um, and so the studio is really around kind of taking that control back um, and then thinking about how you can um, kind of distribute and push that content um, or get that content pulled into different uh, spaces and places. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I think you're you're blowing Alchemist Six's mind right now in the chat. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mitch Harris asked, um, "How can I become a creator on the Lamina One Hub? Like, what 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 do pe people have to do? Like, can anyone become a creator right now?" Yeah, absolutely. It's a completely open access uh, system, and so yeah, I, I would say you're a creator if you publish one piece of content. Um, um, obviously, you know, the, we'll talk a little bit more. I think later on. I don't know. I don't want to um, cover questions that we're going to be covering later, but there's going to be more functionality coming to support. Um, you know, once once I publish a piece of content, how do I actually get it out there? How, how do I actually sell it, et cetera, um, or distribute it to, um, to potential collectors or distribute it to users? Uh, we have a, a number of different things we're working on there. Um, but yeah, really becoming a creator means using the, using the studio and, and publishing content. Um, and actually really it's more of a mindset. <laughs> it's, it's probably nothing to do with our tools, right? Like you're, you're probably already creating today in some shape or form, um, uh, but certainly, certainly, you know, we're, we're excited about the traction that we've seen so far, and um, you know, we we, we definitely, uh, you know, on, in our minds, you know, we we're trying to uh, put in place um, plans to get much closer to the, uh, you know, particular types of creators and really understand what their needs are. We've done a lot of kind of research and survey work, um, you know. Uh, you know, as the, as the as this project got started, et cetera, but we're gonna start checking in with the community and actually start getting kind of more information and qualitative feedback on um, uh, on, on the tooling, et cetera, to really understand how this supports the needs of different types of creators and, and whether or not we're hitting the mark. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's a perfect segue. I've got a ton of questions from the community just about like the functionality of the new tool set that we just published. Um, I guess to kind of start off with, the more brass tack stuff. Uh, Maria Mariana asks, you know, how many artworks or items can or should we be creating? Like, is there any limit or is it just, you know, however many tokens and items you have? I can take this one. Yeah, so at the moment, there are no limits in, um, inherent to either of the templates that are available. So you can, as long as you have L1 tokens, you can keep creating content. Obviously, you know, there's only two types of content you can release at the moment. So um, to the extent that, you know, you still have stuff you want to publish and share with the community, um, feel free to keep doing it. Eventually, as part of some of the features we're going to be working on in the future, um, we might implement templates that have, say, limited releases or, um, you know, limited minting functionality so that, say, only 100 items from this template might be able to be uh, created. So that might be something that a, a certain template creator might decide to implement um, for their community. But otherwise, there's no limit. As long as you have L1 to cover the cost of minting, you can um, create and publish as many pieces of content as you'd like. Yeah, and as a as a quick community management alert, um, for those who may have missed it, we did release a new faucet drip of 10 L1 tokens. So if you go into beta net discussion, hit backslash faucet and wait and make sure you plug in your address, uh, you should be able to get a new batch of 10 tokens. We wanted to make sure that everyone had enough funds to mint at least a, a few items um, outside of the sort of beta net airdrop that we did. So definitely get those tokens if you can. Um, Cornelius AST asks, uh, will the NFTs minted in the beta net be migrated to the main net as well, or are these just test assets for now? 
right now they're envisioned as test assets. We don't have any plans to migrate um, stuff that's minted on the Beninet directly over to mainnet. It's maybe technically possible, but very challenging to do. So we're definitely not going to guarantee that's something um, that we're going to offer. So right now, I'd say treat the studio as um, purely uh, a way to test out functionality. Don't build anything um, that you hope to like build real value around just yet. Awesome. Um, Juke Seth asks, um, you know, will items and NFTs created in the studio be able to be used on different blockchains in the future? Like, is that part of our roadmap for this? Yes. Um, I mean, currently, the NFTs will be able to migrate um, specifically to other EVA, EVM chains within the Avalanche ecosystem. Um, after mainnet, we can start to leverage some of the bridges in the Avalanche ecosystem to allow transfers to other major EVM chains out there. Um, but there will be some implications um, around that. You know, when we talk a little bit more about IP rights or, or royalty rights, I should say, um, you know, some of those might be harder to enforce if you move them to other chains than others um, or other platforms, I should say, than others. But in general, NFTs uh, should be able to move um, around within the Avalanche ecosystem fairly freely and then eventually through to any other EVM chain that's currently bridged with Avalanche. Awesome. Um, we got an anonymous user, someone who didn't leave their name, that asks, um, as more creators use the Lamina One network, um, how do you enforce IP or creator rights or copyright rules? Um, we, I know we've got like, a very kind of like a quick section in the um, in the current templates to kind of ask you about rights, whether or not you want to maintain the IP, whether or not you want AI to train on it, a couple of those questions. So would love to kind of dive into, you know, how are those kind of rights enforced and like, how are those going to kind of grow with the platform? This is a big uh, question, I know. <laughs> it's It's a really, really tough question. Um, Gordon, did you have any thoughts on this one or you want me to take it? Um, I think you, I think you should take it. It's largely a kind of technical challenge. Yeah. So IP rights, um, are definitely going to be a challenge. Um, I think one of the things we want to try to leverage here, especially given, um, the platform is decentralized and open, and we're trying not to maintain a lot of centralized control as a team or an, as an organization, um, is to maybe try to leverage um, community content moderation and, and flagging um, around misuse of IP. Um, so our approach would likely combine some form of community-driven governance with um, like on-chain triggers to uh, kind of react to community flags. So like, for example, I, I could imagine users could flag content that they suspect of IP infringement, um, trigger a sort of decentralized moderation review that might take um, maybe a subsample of the community in a sort of DAO-like structure and have them, you know, basically review a, a complaint, an IP complaint. Um, and by doing that, like part of, I think, what our overall uh, strategy is with regards to the community that's going to be built around the hub and around the studio is going to be this notion of um, kind of loyalty and reputation within the ecosystem. So that loyalty and reputation could uh, be leveraged in a number of ways within the platform. It could get you access to exclusive content. Um, it could give you better visibility within the platform or, you know, on the other side of the, the coin, you know, if you lose a lot of reputation, if you get flagged a lot, if you get reported a lot, you might lose visibility within the platform. Um, so it's harder for your content or you as an individual and an identity to surface up um, through like public channels. So I think like there's no perfect way to... Um, to sort of monitor and and um, respect IP rights um, and licenses um, in the real world, but especially in the the Web three world where you have a lot less centralized control. 
Um, so my my take would be to to try to leverage the community as much as possible and um, kind of mechanics around reputation to to try to enforce um, rights as much as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I will say we're doing a ton of research into this right now. I've, I think I've shared a couple of links in the channels with a, with a few of you and like some sort of like decentralized moderation structures and things that we're looking into, but very much like on the ground level. So if anyone in the community has like any thoughts or any interesting resources on this, like definitely let us know because um, obviously like this is phase one, we have to make sure that the tech works, but like that system is definitely going to have to grow. And I will say, like, from the research that I've done, it's very new um, and kind of like this untested field and style of moderation, which is exciting, but um, very, like, it's a lot to dive into for sure. Um, mm -hmm. This kind of actually folds into, like, related questions around ja that Jacko Girl has kind of been asking us as well. And I don't think we need to re-answer like she's you know obviously also asked about the kind of plan for content moderation or reporting but like there are definitely like you know things where you know what if someone uploads an image that they don't hold the ip to um or like this actually happened to jackal girl this week where someone tried to give her credit um for their item and jackal girl was like i didn't like help you make this item and so it's like what kind of like structures are we considering having in, in place around that? I know that like the tool sets really bare bones right now, but I, I think, you know, people are already kind of anticipating the sort of like problems that, that, that could arise with this really open system for content creation. Right. Yeah. Let me, let, let me um, take, take this one if I can. I think as it relates to kind of credit, co-creator credits, yeah, we, we've certainly thought about this problem before and, we chose to ship the version of this product without any uh, strong support for kind of an approval process. So we imagine a better experience would be the creator um, chooses to co-credit somebody else. Um, and then that person uh, would receive a message and would have to approve that um, that statement, um, that assertion essentially that that person was a co-creator. Um, and we plan to do, to do this kind of on-chain as well. So it's not going to prevent you from publishing the content. Like we can certainly support the content being published and then once the co-creators start approving then we'll you know that data will flow in and and, and kind of be appended to to the item um so yeah we, i think we, we think we have a good solution here i will address a couple of these points as well kind of in a, in a, a little bit of a different context um when we talk about the decentralized approaches to content moderation etc we think that the, that's really really valuable the reality is that when it comes uh, to the laminar one hub itself you know as a um, you, know, uh, you know, as a company that is building a product that is delivering it to uh, to people, we do have to be compliant with regulations that exist out there. Um, and so we certainly will have some kind of moderation processes that might ultimately end up with kind of hiding content from the front end, even though it might exist on chain. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 those would be things like um, uh, copyright, for example. Um, uh, it could be... Um, certain types of content, uh, illegal content, for example, uh, we certainly have to be able to honor notices from the DMCA and um, law enforcement, for example, in the United States uh, to support those, those things. Awesome. Yeah, I do. I do want to note that, you know, a lot of creators probably notice that in order, like when you're uploading your image in the template flow, you get a message that says like, by uploading this image, you attest that like it's your original creation, you hold the IP and that it uh, aligns with our terms of service. And I feel like that's definitely key. Obviously, it's sort of like a you could publish whatever you wanted technically, but it also like according to our terms of service, like if you're infringing on someone's rights, like RTOS like says like we can take down that content from the hub front end visibly. Like we, we want to make sure obviously that like we don't have crazy impersonation or people like trying to sell artworks that aren't theirs. That's like hugely important to us, obviously. So yeah, it's it's definitely been something that we've been thinking and talking a ton about as we roll out this new feature. And we're, we're glad that you guys are thinking about it as well. And definitely keep sharing your thoughts with us and concerns in the um, in the discord because we're watching. Um, Finally, yeah, and there may, and there may uh, one more, there may be some more solutions there. Sorry, as well, kind of from a technical perspective, in terms of at upload time, you know, checking to see if that work 
that that particular asset already exists on the, on, has been created on the network. Um, obviously, you know people can just modify an asset in a very small way, and kind of a simple check wouldn't be able to cap, capture that. So there are certainly kind of AI based solutions that um, have been developed over the years that can help with this with with this type of thing. Um, uh, in terms of kind of checking checking the work, but you know, if we're only checking lambda one, that doesn't really help someone necessarily because content is being created everywhere, and we when we certainly don't have visibility into everything. So um, it is a very a very challenging thing to solve. Yeah, definitely. All right, one more question on this before we move on to some other stuff. But Ed Keys asks um, more on the royalties front than the rights front. Um, I will say we don't have royalties in this V1 iteration, but they are coming very soon. But Ed Keys asks, you know, NFT royalties seems difficult to enforce in an open trading environment. Does the team have some clever ideas there? You want me to take this one, Gordon? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I think royalties, in much the same way that IP rights are difficult to enforce, have always been difficult to enforce, even in the real world. Um, there are some things you can do specifically on chain um, to make the royalty process um, at least more transparent, but also more enforceable, at least within our, the platforms that respect them. Um, so we are obviously going to support the ability to establish royalties directly within the items that you create and mint. Um, and those royalties are obviously going to be um, enforceable and respected within our platform. And then there becomes the question of how do you um, kind of manage people trying to get around the the restrictions in place like within the hub front end and try to you know transfer ro uh, royalty protected assets um, directly on chain there's a couple approaches that are used to do this one of them is called token wrapping um, and i think in general like we will have some some stronger technical approaches to this but i think in general our our thoughts are to not let um, perfect be the enemy of good here and so initially will try to create uh, a sort of platform and ecosystem where you know 90 plus percent of the time um, royalties will be respected as intended because of the convenience um, and great ux involved with utilizing the hub platform and the ecosystem built around it um, and of course all the royalties are, are inherently respected within that ecosystem um, moving towards trying to capture that kind of 10 plus percent that are going to try to get around the the platform integration. Um, we're looking at some technical approaches uh, like limit breaks ERC 1155C proposal. Um, and that, that essentially introduces a whitelist mechanism. Um, and that would mean that the item that's minted could only be resold or transferred um, using a marketplace or a smart contract that honors the embedded or the marketplace is literally the white um the end of the long using the whereas for it's obviously not perfect. I don't know if I have a question for the figure to make. Um, we don't have, say, more control over how content you can produce. But I should guarantee of the streamer to be eliminating some of the errors that people well, may try to cut you off here. You are very garbled, and we cannot understand you. You might need to pick, uh, change up your connection, or disconnect, or reconnect. You you turned into a robot halfway through, unfortunately. Can you still hear me, or am I garbled? Yeah, no. Now you're good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Where did I? Sorry where did I get? That. Oh God! Like in the. You might want to just start again. You, you, <laughs> yeah, you, I think white, whitelist is probably one of the last things that was clear. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the the technical approaches we're we're trying to leverage to get around uh, to address people trying to get around the uh, integrated enforcement of royalties within the platform is 
a sort of whitelist approach that's been proposed by Limit Break um, with their ERC 1155C proposal, um, which we can share a link to. Um, but basically what this does is it creates a whitelist of approved, pre-approved uh, smart contracts and marketplaces that are guaranteed to respect the royalties that are embedded within an item. Um, this isn't obviously a perfect solution for everyone because um, there's going to be a lot of, say, fans or potential consumers of content that won't want you know, an explicit whitelist restriction on the way that they can transfer or use their content. And so there, there will be a sort of trade-off decision that creators are going to have to make over um, how much control they have over how the content is used and transferred while guaranteeing um, maybe a, uh, you know, stronger guarantee, having stronger guarantees over downstream royalties, um, but possibly alienating some fans or do they sort of take the risk that people may try to bypass these downstream royalties, but they keep the potential use of their content more flexible? So there is going to be a sort of trade-off. It is a trade-off that the creator is going to be able to make themselves. Um, but that is one way we're, we're kind of looking at um, sort of real enforceable royalties on chains. Um, and then, you know, kind of similar to what we were talking about before, there's also sort of... Uh, a way we could envision leveraging reputation and loyalty within the communities um, to sort of incentivize compliance with royalties rather than like strictly trying to technically enforce it. Um, and so again, you can imagine, you know, a system where if you've been consistently doing official purchases of content from a specific creator, you might gain loyalty with that creator which again could be leveraged through exclusive content, um, through you know maybe explicit rewards. Um, and so that would be more about creating a community culture and incentive structure around respecting the royalties rather than trying to create um, you know, strong technical means, which are again, come with trade-offs. Awesome. That was a super in-depth answer. Gordon, is there anything you want to add into that or should we move on to some more questions? I think we want to, yeah. Great. Um, so I think, you know, you've talked about the eventual possibility to buy and sell NFTs on Lamina One. This has been one of our biggest questions across the community. Um, I'm going to credit Avatar V for this specific question, but like, when is that going to be possible to buy and sell NFTs on Lamina One? And can we give like a little bit of a preview on how that'll work? Yeah, we actually have another question kind of <laughs> what's next on the horizon. So I was going to cover it then, but um, in more detail, but let's we're launching. Both. Let's do both. Okay, I'll try at a high level. We're launching um, a feature we call Profiles, um, which uh, we, we've started work on. So it will be in the next major release. Uh, profiles enable uh, people to kind of publish um, a, a page publicly uh, where people can get access to their creations. Um, and that's going to be the kind of point of. Um, transaction, et cetera, where I can choose to buy something. Um, and then we'll have a set of tooling that supports the, uh, the creator and, and the kind of the, 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 the decisions they need to make around selling. So yeah, we're, we're working on it. We, we know it's, obviously it's a really critical part of distribution. Um, and uh, so we are really, really investing in it right now as a complement to the studio. Awesome. Um, Ginger Rafikat asks, uh, do you know when other types of content will be able to be minted through the studio? Um, I know we obviously, earlier in this AMA, we brought, Will brought up um, a couple of uh, features, you know, obviously these first two templates are just the beginning of the different kind of content types and formats you can publish. Um, but also, so, I mean, Gordon or Will question for you about like, what are the other types of content we're really considering and prioritizing? And I think, there's a second part of the question that's even more interesting, which is, you know, how will the publishing costs be kind of like calculated across like different types of content? Yeah, I, I'll, I, I can take this. So, um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're broadly, you know, looking at all forms of multimedia content. Uh, we've started with you know, basic image content. We're um, going to be working on kind of uh, 3D content um, next. And then we're looking at audio. Uh, video, 
uh, literature kind of, or prose, kind of like these, what, what I would call the kind of like base content types. Um, you know, an audio file is an audio file, but and you don't know what it is until you open it. And so if I had an MP3 on my machine, I wouldn't know what it was unless it was labeled correctly. Um, and so uh, what, we'll, what we will be doing is, evol evol sorry, and those, those kind of base content types over the next six months, that's really where a lot of the focus is. There are challenges dealing with things like large file sizes, for example. We know that, um, you know, there is a limitation in the studio right now in terms of a one megabyte upload, uh, largely because of uh, choices around uh, technical implementation of uh, saving, saving drafts. Um, however, we are going to be uh, removing those barriers and increasing the file sizes to accommodate the 3D objects and, um, you know, and three, five meg MP3s and, and you know, and much, much, much bigger video files. Uh, and so once we kind of remove those technical barriers and, and kind of um, add more support in the, in, the, in the creator experience to support these different types of content, we'll be expanding those base content types. But over time, we're going to be also kind of creating abstract content types. So for example, instead of an audio fi file, think of a music track um, or a podcast or an audio book. Um, and we, we really think these are much more full concepts because they are really the things that people care about creating. And they're the things that people care about um, buying, owning, interacting with, experiencing, et cetera. And so um, what that means in reality is that you know, when, when I capture information and metadata about a music track, that's very different than a podcast, semantically, um, descriptively. And so ensuring we can kind of kind of capture those different types of um, uh, metadata information is, is, is really, really um, critical there to support distribution of that content into spaces. Um, as it relates to publishing costs, um, there's kind of like, um, uh, there, there are a couple of factors that really influence it. One is the kind of base economic cost of, minting items on, um, on, the, on the chain. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're still kind of looking at the economic model of, of, of that. Um, one of the most significant costs, and I always say one of the most variable costs, however, is uh, related to the actual asset itself and how big it is and how many megs or gigs in storage it takes. And so the publishing cost of storing that media asset um, on a, in a storage system um, is, is a real cost. And so, you know, right now um, we have an implementation with IPFS uh, where essentially we're taking on kind of like the, um, um, all of the infrastructure to support um, storing on IPFS, um, but in particular also serving from IPFS. And, you know, there are real costs that, uh, that we're taking on there. And so um, there is going to be a need to ultimately cover those costs and it will be very depending on how much, how much you store. Over time, we do plan to kind of provide different, cost options for storage or which, which made uh, different service options for storage that have different cost and performance and availability trade-offs. Uh, but uh, for example, we, you know, we would consider integrating with Arweave. Um, so I could choose to deploy on IPFS or Arweave or Falcon or whatever the storage network is that I choose. And then you have complete control over deciding on those trade-offs. Arweave, uh, for example, gives you a extremely strong permanence guarantee but it does cost more to actually upload that content up front because they commit to storing it for a hundred years. Um, and you may want to do that or you may not. Um, and so we're gonna kind of give you, give you those choices. Um, the other thing as it relates to kind of publishing cost is, is you know, there are things that we might be doing in, in the published process or features that we wanna offer the creator in the published process that increase that cost as well. So right now, um, you know, all of the contracts that, um, power each of the templates are you know are owned and managed by by lamina one um however you know there is a desire for people to be able to for creators to own those contracts themselves um that's usually for you know for for control purposes you know being the owner of that contract on chain being able to control access to that contract how that contract gets updated and for some you know for certain types of creator that's going to be really really important to have that guarantee but that has a much more um, a significant cost in terms of publishing because what we have to do in the publishing process is publish a smart contract just for the creator, which has an implicit um, a much higher gas cost chain. So it will, will, it will be more expensive, but you get the benefit of being the contract yourself. And so, um, so yeah, that's how, kind of how we're thinking about cost. Is there anything else I missed, Will? Just signing on mute. No, I think I think you covered um, the bulk of it for sure.
Awesome. Um, kind of related to profiles, um, we also got a number of questions from like Cody Cisco, Space Junk, and other creators, which is basically asking like, how can I see what other L1 creators are publishing? So like, you know, do we have a plan for curated or searchable galleries or a marketplace? Or I, I think a lot of people are really excited to kind of see what other people are minting and what's what's kind of are, I mean, I don't want to ruin the punchline for you here, but um, how do profiles fit into that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pro profiles are kind of like the first step of, um, you know, really making things public. Um, even the reality is that the, all of this, all of the content is published on chain. In theory, somebody could create an application that would be, you know, provide a front end to everything that's being created on Lamina One. Um, uh, and, and we'd love to see people develop applications in that way and new types of experiences to explore content being created. Um, but when, you know, as we, as we put profiles out there, um, it gives us kind of like two entry points into what's being created on chain. You have both the, the creators themselves and, and what they're doing and the story that they're telling. Um, and then you have the content itself. And so we're, we are going to be adding kind of discovery um, to the hub experience. Um, initially, it is going to be very much uh, curated, but it's going to be, you know, showcasing um, uh, you know, content and creators that are doing interesting things on on Lamina One. And ultimately, we do plan to support a search capability as well, so it's going to be much easier to find find that content by keyword or by creator type or content type, etc. Um, uh, but that, that's that's certainly going to be much later this year that we're going to be enabling that type of capability as it relates to marketplaces. Um, we, we certainly don't, you know, our, our priority is on giving people a place to publish their content that enables people to access it and that being the primary channel of distribution. Um, and, and that will also support resale capabilities. So if somebody buys um, uh, a con content from a creator um, and then chooses to sell it again, that will be available from their profile. So you can kind of think of these as independent storefronts. Um, um, right now, we don't really have any plans for for a marketplace necessarily, but we do believe that um, marketplaces will will emerge and be required specifically for particular um, uh, story worlds or games or or, or things like that. And, and um, there is potentially some tooling there um, to be provided. But also, there's a lot of third party marketplaces. There's a lot of marketplace technology that's developed. Um, and we, we we like a lot of it. Um, uh, Rarible, for example, is you know, extremely creator oriented and really focused on um, building out a great marketplace experience. So we imagine there's going to be marketplaces that support Lamina One, and we started having those conversations. Um, and and we, we really don't want to like you know re rebuild things where it's not necessary. Definitely. Thank you, Gordon. Well, we're definitely nearing the end of this AMA. Um, I want to just thank everyone for this early testing. I think as you guys can kind of probably tell from this AMA, um, we're going to be having another Creator Studio AMA very shortly um, after the sort of like next ro round of features kind of roll out over the coming weeks. Obviously, this is a stage launch. It's going to grow and expand sort of as the Lamina One Hub does, um, you know, typical to Lamina One fashion. So definitely stay tuned and we'll dive into further details about all of that stuff once you actually have a lot of those technologies in your hands. I will say in the meantime, you know, if you guys do want to kind of share and collaborate on images and kind of show other people what you're making, um, we do have our NFTs channel um, that you can actually share directly to. Um, I've actually been having a lot of fun checking out that channel and just seeing what people are minting. Lots of cats and lots of images of Neil Stevenson so far, which has uh, been fun. Um, and I also just want to say that um, tomorrow, I am kind of spinning up a surprise for everyone in the community. Um, we obviously have gotten a lot of requests for kind of like AI image generation recs so that people can like easily spin up like laser art and stuff. So I've been talking to um, a really cool company called Foundation and we're actually we're going to be launching a couple of uh, creative jams uh, this week where you guys will be able to just kind of like easily prompt and spin up uh, custom lasers and um, artworks that you guys can kind of share, jam on, collaborate together. It's a it's a new tool that we'll be testing out together. Um, 
but it should make item creation like even faster and easier. They're they're actually even working into it so that you can generate an image on our Discord server directly. It'll compress it like specifically to hub specifications and you can upload it directly. So stay tuned for that. Um, definitely keeping our ears to the ground on what your needs are and really want to just facilitate as much item generation and creation and you know, find as many uh, kind of like interesting thoughts and like holes in the system if there are any. So again, thank you all so much. Um, Creator Studio testing is going to continue through at least the end of this week, after which we do have some exciting launches on the horizon coming up, including um, we teased this kind of late last year, but the launch of Nyric, which will be our next demo space. It's going to be by L1 Early Access Partner Lovelace where you can actually prompt explore quest and explore and collect NFTs in unique AI generated environments. Um, as Gordon mentioned, um, Hubside, the launch of creator profiles, um, which will be a platform to view, buy, sell and trade content on Lamina One, and also kind of just begin sharing and establishing your like public open metaverse identity that's coming up soon. Um, new template types, including 3D avatars, video, audio, prose, Gen AI. And of course, um, you know, we, we've said this a couple of times, uh, we get the when mainnet question about 17 times a day, but we are gearing to launch Lamina One mainnet in Q2, Q3 2024. So the team, in addition to developing the heck out of the hub and uh, making sure that this content creation framework is kind of growing alongside us. We're also really, really um, gearing up for that mainnet launch. Um, and that's obviously going to be super exciting. Um, stay tuned for announcements and updates related to that as, as we keep kind of pushing forward. Um, but yeah, as always, I'll keep you all posted on our progress and well fed with quests and testing and feedback challenges in the meantime. Um, I'm going to share our secret code for this AMA in the chat now for everyone who listened. So again, thank you all so much. You guys can plug this into Zeely for some XP. Um, here's the code right here. You can probably all hear me typing it in. Um, and yeah, we'll catch you next time. Thank you all so much for joining us. We had a lot of really awesome questions and it seems like everyone's really excited about this and we are too. So definitely stay tuned. Thanks for joining Will and Gordon and um, we'll all talk to you guys soon. Thanks everyone. Take care.